my talk topic i have not just said complex but i'm just calling it coverage of left defects but because i think even the simplest of wounds can turn complex if not managed right uh, primarily so with the fast paced life that we lead with the roads people crossing roads going crowded on streets uh, crossing trains and having really crowded trains uh, we know that the maximum load of lower limb cases that we get is of trauma and these are the cases that most of us probably see at least in public hospitals on a daily basis but even in private hospitals large number of such cases come to us but as sir mentioned we are very often in fact more often than not getting patients in this situation where time has already gone by the golden hours and the golden days have also gone by and we are having to deal with situations like this where there is exposed hardware or bones are exposed for a very long time as you see in these cases but as sir mentioned the etiology is not always trauma and i remember when we did our mbbs we were always told that whatever question is asked if you are asked etiology it would fit in one of these so even in lower limb you may have cases where it could be your defect is because of a tumor it could be because of infection and when i say iatrogenic iatrogenic i mean that you could have excised uh, let us say maybe it's a post burn contracture or something for which an excision has been done so what is the basic difference between trauma and tumor and and let us say infection let me not take iatrogenic right now so uh, in trauma you have something uh, which is called the zone of trauma and as time goes by there is also fibrosis which may involve a little even little bit more than the zone of trauma so there is there is also a difference between how we handle a case when you do it as acute vis-a-vis when it becomes an old case with respect to tumor the good part is that the ex- whatever you are excising uh, that is the defect and there is no real zone of trauma because the excision would be complete but defects of a uh, tumor especially are exceedingly very large so very often there would be a defect of the nerve also or maybe tendons or it's possible that there could be a bone defect and you would have to do both whenever we have defects which are because of infection again though we don't call it a zone of trauma but the amount of uh, fibrosis is a lot so especially when we are talking of vessels occasionally all of this is enmeshed in the fibrosis so again infection becomes a little different kind of uh, of case my thoughts on this after so many years is that if we are really very good with trauma we are very good with our anatomy then we would be able to use the same principles for cases which are because of infection now these are a few cases which are not of trauma like i showed you the first three that you are seeing are all tumors they are they are two are sarcomas and one of those was this one that you see is a uh, is a marjolin ulcer uh the one on the left this is a sarcoma and here also this was also a fungating sarcoma the ones lower down that you see this was a pyoarthrosis of the knee and he was in very bad shape when he came to me this even though it looks very small it looks like a scar but this was a chronic osteomyelitis which a very bad tibia beneath and here as you see is a is uh, is uh, an infection which has eaten up the whole of soft tissues of the lower limb so now since i have to talk about coverage we need to talk about how are we going to decide what type of coverage will we give i think one of the most important points obviously regarding coverage would be what is going to be your defect that is what is the deficit in that certain patient first and the simplest one for us would be that there is just a soft tissue defect with no exposed vital structure and in most of these patients we would be able to get away with a skin graft or you could have a soft tissue defect with an exposed vital structure but that exposed vital structure is yet viable so you need to just give a soft tissue cover next is if there is a muscle or a tendon loss or if there is a bone loss or if there is a neurovascular deficit in that area because of injury in that area or a combination of all of them so you may be just doing a cover or you may be doing a cover with an immediate reconstruction or you could be giving cover with late reconstruction or you may be giving a cover and then surgery may be done by another specialty and since this is the lower limb it is the orthopedic surgeons 
So giving examples of these, for example, cover and done, there is a bone exposed, I've given cover, I've, maybe I've given a sural artery flap or I've done an ALT and I'm over and done with and the job is done. Or let us say we have to give a cover where there is a bone loss and we may decide to give a free fibula flap where there is a bone loss and do a complete reconstruction at the same time. Or you may be doing a bone graft inside and putting a cover on top of it if it's a smaller bone defect. Cover and late reconstruction, for example, there could be a nerve defect or a tendon loss and you do not want to do it simultaneously. So you may do a flap and you may do a nerve reconstruction after three months. Or when we say surgery by ortho later, often we get cases where there is a scar in the knee and they want to do a scar or maybe there's a raw area in the knee and they want to do a knee joint replacement. So they may ask us for simply to give coverage of the knee, which is a soft, supple tissue over which later on they can do their joint replacement. Now, when we talk of the lower limb, we cannot get away without talking about bone defects. So this talk of mine is going to be a little wide and varied. I'm not going to be very specific, but I want to cover a lot of points in this. So when we talk of bone defect, this is something that we face in, a in our daily practice where we have to have our joint uh, discussions with the orthopedic surgeons. If there is a bone defect, how do we cover it? The simplest one from our point of view is, of course, we put in a bone graft, whether it is vascularized or non-vascularized. But there are other things that we as plastic surgeons need to know as to how the orthopedic surgeons manage to bridge larger bone gaps. So one of these is to do it by bone transport. So what are the ways they do it? Sometimes they tell us that you do the flap and we will do bone transport later. And they may do it as a later stage or at times they say that we will do acute docking of the gap. When you say acute docking, that gap is immediately reduced. You can give her cover and then when things are settled off the cover, they will do an osteotomy at the opposite end of that bone gap and then again do the same as Elizaro. There is another technique called Kapana's technique for a bone defect, more often than not, these are being used for cases of tumor where exceedingly long bone gaps are, uh, are there. Sometimes it's the whole of the femur, something like that. In these cases, when you are going uh, doing a free fibula for, let us say, the femur, you want more strength. So in these cases, an allograft of the femur is taken from the bone bank and the free fibula flap is pushed into the intramedullary canal of this allograph. You need to give gaps from where the, obviously you don't want to make it so tight that the fibula is going to have a problem and you need to give out your gaps for the vessels to come out. And this Kapana technique helps in better uh, strength for the fibula, for the uh, femur. Now, what are the other factors that, to be, that are to be considered when we talk about coverage? It is a situation that you are in. So, I am calling it situational. Is the case that you are seeing that has been referred to you in an emergency, is it a semi-emergency or routine? Then, the next thing that is to be considered is the tissue. I will take the emergency situation a bit later. Ne next thing that we have to think about is a tissue defect. That is, we have to assess the defect. And the same thing what I told earlier, what are the tissue to be reconstructed immediately and what can be reconstructed at a later date. Then what are the available tissues that is to be assessed? We need to assess the zone of trauma. We have to assess the adjacent scars, whether there are fresh scars or old scars. We also need to look at scars of donor site in the flaps, the skin graft for the bone graft and specifically the regional flaps that are around. And that is going to help you decide whether you're going to do an inferiorly based flap, superiorly based flap or from the medial side or lateral side. The patient's comorbid can factors are also very important. And if you have a patient with a lot of problems and you would think twice before doing a free flap and you would be better off having knowledge, good knowledge of the regional flap, you can give the patient a, a surgery with lesser time spent in anesthesia. And I think patients' wishes and wants are also exceedingly important. And lastly, we must give an equal credence to the surgeon's expertise and the comfort level with type of surgery. There are surgeons who can get away with very good regional flaps 
in places where some people would be able to only do a free flap. Uh, my thought very often is that a free flap is sort of the lazy way out when you do not want to think about regional flaps. And in, especially in the lower limb, if the skin is available, then regional flaps are exceedingly good choices and you can cover almost the whole limb with, with some regional flap or the other. Talking about an emergency situation, obviously, even if you get a patient like this, along with the rest of the emergency team, you have to check the general condition of the patient. We have to also remember that it is very difficult to assess vascularity of the distal limb till the BP is stabilized. Till the patient is stabilized, we have to control all bleeding. SOS, we can use clamps so that we don't injure any main vessels and give a splint in the meantime. Also confirm that no tourniquet has been tied earlier as first aid before we start saying that there is no vascularity in the lower part and assess your defect and requirements. In investigations, along with clinical, we can do handheld Doppler, we can do color Doppler, x-rays obviously need to be done, angiography if it's a close injury, only if it is needed, except if there's a posterior dislocation of the knee, which is an emergency. Before we do any revascularization, it is essential to do a bony stabilization because if we do not stabilize, then the vessels will continue to go into spasm. And occasionally, simply bony stabilization of a limb like this will bring back the pulses. So when we talk of emergency, very, very quickly, I need to tell you a little bit about classification. Why are classifications needed? For two reasons. One is, of course, to be able to have some standardization so that when I am describing, for, describing something, when the next doctor sees it, they understand only by classification and also in the lower limb specifically because we want to know whether the limb is salvageable or no. I think I won't really uh, describe the Gustillo in detail, but all I can say is that this system uses the amount of energy, the extent of the soft tissue that the person has, uh, uh, has had and the extent of contamination that is it. And it progresses from grade 1 to 3C. And when it goes higher, it implies a higher potential for complications. Also, along with Gustillo, over a period of time, there have been um, inputs and according to the Gustillo classification, even antibiotics have been described. Uh, the other score which is being, so Gustillo is basically uh, just a classification to say that uh, uh, this is the kind of injury that is there. And um, it of course helps tell us that uh, whether it is salvageable or no, or I should say, what is the extent of uh, reconstruction that would be needed. The score which is routinely used for understanding whether one need one whether the limb can be salvaged or will go ahead for an amputation is the mangled extremity severity score. This is the commonest score that is used, and it assesses your skeletal and it assesses uh, the the injury in four groups: the skeletal and soft tissue group, age group, shock group, and the ischemia group. So when you talk of skeletal and soft tissue, your points go from 1 to 4 with low energy to massive crush like a rail, railway accident going to 4. Then in age, anybody less than 30 years is 0, anybody more than 50 years is 2 points. When you say the shock group, it is from normotensive going on to prolonged hypotension. And finally and most important, you have the ischemia group which goes from no problem to an ischemia of over 6 hours. But there is a very big problem with MESS, but with this scoring, because it, it this scoring says that any score which is more than 6 has a very li high likelihood of amputation. The MESS score is a very old score now. And with today's improvement in intensive care, with today's improvement in microvascular surgery, I cannot imagine that a person who comes in with a railroad ac railway accident with a massive crush We'll give four points. If the person is more than 50 years old, gets two points. And even if there is, even if the person is normotensive and with just, just minor diminishment of the pulses, it goes over six points. So I think mess needs to be given up. And we have a much better score, which is called as the GHOISS, the Ganga Hospital Open Injury Score. The GHOISS is very detailed and it helps us much better than the MESS score. The, the scoring is, the points are much more. 
and the points which are also taken in terms of you know the coverage of tissues that is you're talking of skin and fascia then the next point that is going to be discussed is bone and joints the next one is on functional tissues and they it also takes into factor the comorbid factors the good thing is that there is also a gray zone in between and on a case to case basis we can we can decide whether the person is going to go in for an amputation or whether the limb can be salvaged if you go into the details of the components of the ganga score you'll realize that it is exceedingly detailed and there are points which go from 1 point to 5 point in each of these groups i'm not going to detail this right now it will take a very long time i would suggest that this is an open access thing it also helps you to the website of so if you see this i have given you the website this this one and when you go to that website you can actually calculate the score also i think i find it very interesting that along with this they also provide you wound management guidelines and this is purely from a plastic surgery point of view so when you look at the skin and fascia scoring they combine the skin and fascia scoring along with the total score so and give us guidelines whether we should consider primary suture consider delayed suture whether we do a early flap whether we do a delayed flap and whether we do a stage reconstruction so i think that all the older older scores can be left aside and this would be the best score to go by my thought also is that when we are more organized in this manner then medico legally we are safer when we use a score when we are talking about amputation as plastic surgeons though our choice is always to reconstruct we have to have also balance especially in the lower limb about how long the reconstruction is going to take and what are the benefits of going in early now talking about coverage as uh, sir bhattacharya sir mentioned when you talk of the leg you you divide it so that it is easy for us to know in areas where the flaps you know where there are commonly done flaps and the similar kind of flaps can be done for one area so we have the knee we have the upper third of the leg most of the flaps that can be done for the upper third of the leg will also have a reach in the knee we have the middle third of the leg the lower third of the leg and then you have the malleolite tendoacullus and anterior ankle and then of course you have the sole so some of, some of the uh, flaps which reach your tendoacullus will also extend up to the heel so what are the types of cover since it is cover i cannot again say that we should not be talking about skin grafts so wherever a vital uh, structure is not uh, exposed to if we do not need to go in for surgery again you could very much go ahead with skin grafts if you feel that uh, it is an area which needs thicker skin today in today's day and age we also have dermal substitutes you could use a dermal substitute over it and then put a skin graft now with respect to flaps one can have local or regional flaps and we can have distant flaps so what are the flaps we should never forget the basic transposition flap depending on the size of the uh size of the defect that we have we can do a simple transposition flap the superiorly or the inferiorly based facio cutaneous flaps are also basically like transposition flap they they have a sort of turn which is like a transposition with some amount of rotation also so those flaps are there and i think these are the main stay of uh, of uh, coverage in the lower limb in the leg specifically then we have uh, the same ones could also be done as adipofacial flaps the gastrocnemius and the soleus are wonderful flaps for the upper third and the middle third of the leg you could extend a gastrocnemius to also be a musculocutaneous flap again the sural artery flap is basically a facio cutaneous flap and one can do it as distally or block proximally based the distally based ones are the ones which are used for the lower third of the leg and the proximally based ones for the for the upper third of the leg one can do reverse dermis flaps again for small flaps sliding vy flaps have also been described for uh, the uh, tendoacles uh, defects perforator flaps as uh, are uh, as was the first choice in today's case discussion you can have the uh, you can also have the malleolar flap in the distant flaps you have the free flap of course we should never forget the cross leg flap and cross leg flap can also be done as a free flap so i am now just going to list out the flaps that can be done and i will be 
speaking in detail only about the flaps which are the first choice. So when we talk of flaps for the knee region, other than the transposition flap for smaller defects, I think the gastronomous muscle flap or a superiorly based fasciocutaneous flap or a gastronomous musculocutaneous flaps, these are very good choices for the knee region. A, ped a pedicle reverse ALT also does very well for the knee as does the superiorly based pseudal artery flap. For very small defects, if we do a strategic delay of the upper, the main pedicle of the gracilis, it can also be done as reverse. One can always do a free flap or a cross leg flap in any of the defects of the leg. When we talk about flaps for the upper one third of the leg, again the gastronomous muscle flap, whether the medial or the lateral head or both combined can be done as a first choice. The gastronomous musculocutaneous flap, the superiorly based fasciocutaneous transposition flaps based on the peroneal or the posterior tibial perforators. The sural artery flap, which is superiorly based, free flap or cross leg flap. For middle third of the leg, I think a soleus muscle flap is, uh, is something which is comfortably done and is often the first choice. Uh, again, a superiorly or an inferiorly based fasciocutaneous flap can be done for the middle third of the leg. Uh, depending on the skin that is available, whether it is where the skin is more, whether you have more skin above or below. Propeller perforator flaps can be done. You can also, for very small defects, one can also do the smaller muscle flaps. A biopedical flap can also be done, uh, which can be either a fasciocutaneous flap from both sides or one can also incorporate the gastronomus in it with an incision on the uh, mid of the leg posteriorly. Again, a free flap and a cross leg flap. For the lower third of the leg, the inferiorly based fasciocutaneous flaps are wonderful flaps. Uh, though uh, the commoner flap is the sural artery flap, I think the sural artery flap is basically just a fasciocutaneous flap. It's just that we are, uh, we are uh, giving up the sural nerve along with the sural artery flap. Again, the propeller perforator flap, as, as was uh, discussed today in the class, um, inferiorly based soleus muscle flaps can also be done. I have frankly done only one inferiorly based soleus muscle flap. I'm very uncomfortable doing it as an inferiorly based flap that is uh, based on its uh, minor pedicles. Again, muscle flaps can be pulled, mu muscles can be pulled in for very, very small defects, free flap and a cross leg flap. For the malleoli, uh, the tendoaculus, the anterior, anterior ankle or the heel, again, a sural artery flap will cover all of these uh, all of these defects, inferiorly based fasciocutaneous flaps, the lateral supramalleolar flap, inferiorly based soleus muscle flap. Again, for a TA defect, a sliding VY has been described. I have once seen disastrous results in it, so I've never uh, attempted it. Uh, de epithelized turnover flaps can be done in any of the areas, a free flap and a cross leg flap. I'm now going to uh, go to the a muscle flap. As I said, this is some few of the flaps I will describe in detail. Let's talk of the gastronomus. So, uh, what is the major pedicle? The pedicle of the gastronomus arises from the popliteal artery above the uh, popliteal crease and it is the medial and the lateral sural arteries. But there are also some minor pedicles which sort of are branches coming out from the same sural arteries and it also gets perforators from the posterior tibial arteries. Uh, one thing that you have to know is that the, uh, the medial gastronomus is longer than the lateral gastro gastronomus. So it has a better range. So these are just some cadaveric dissection, which is showing you the reach of the flaps. Uh, in, in this case, I have not even cut the origin, but I have dissected it all the way and I have released the pedicle a little bit. As you see here, you can see the lateral aspect and you realize the stark difference between the size of the medial muscle and the lateral muscle. This video is now showing you the reach of the muscle if you do a very good dissection and you will be able to cover up to the upper third of the leg. Same on the lateral side. The 
I'd like to specifically mention that when, when we bring in a lateral uh, gastrocnemius muscle flap, we always have to remember that it has to go over the head of the fibula. So the reach reduces even more. What about the skin territory? Well, the skin territory is basically one to one beyond, one is to one beyond the muscle. Just a few clinical examples. You see that that's the knee and this is the upper third of the leg and the gastronomous muscle has come. So in this case, I have taken an incision which is in the midline of the leg. Another one in the knee and you see a very well settled skin graft over the muscle and you see such a beautifully large gastronomous muscle has come in to cover the defect. Here you see that the defect is in fact almost bordering between the uh, upper third and the middle third and yet we have managed to get a good muscle and have a settled graft over it. The length of the muscle can be checked preoperatively by asking the patient to contract. So occasionally if it's a shorter muscle it may not reach in the lower part of the upper third. Somewhere if it is in the junction of the upper and the middle third you may actually have to do a gastronemus and half a soleus. Here is the uh, pyoarthritis that I spoke about and here you see that since this was a larger defect, I have used both the gastronemus, the medial as well as the lateral and you can see a well settled skin graft over this knee now. This is a case of tumor and you see that a mega prosthesis has been done and along with the mega prosthesis having been done, after the tibia has been, the joint has been removed, a gastronemus muscle has been put and a skin graft put over it. This is an example of a gastronemus uh, myocutaneous flap. In this patient, the patellar tendon was injured and it was absent. So I use the tendon of the gastronemus and the fascia to reconstruct it. And you can see that he has getting a good extension of the leg, which is that much. This is an example of a gastronemus which has been done in an emergency. This was a very, uh, this was a road traffic accident. I did a debridement immediately, cleared up everything. You can see all those exposed bone and the exposed knee joint. The you can see that the gastronemus muscle has been brought in from behind sutured and immediately it was skin grafted and this is a one month late photograph of the patient. Another patient and here you have a punched out defect in the popliteal region. I understand, I'm sorry for the quality of this photograph but this was completely punched out and the lat uh, his um, lateral popliteal nerve was also injured. I used the sural nerve of the same side to reconstruct as you can see here. I've reconstructed the nerve also. And then after that, I've turned the gastronemus and given it cover. This is a late uh, photograph. This is a year later when he's walking, but he did not get return of the, uh, of the anterior muscles. Now I will tell you about, so there are, there are some who are not very fond of the soleus muscle flap, but it does, it's a, it's a, it's a good flap when we need cover over the bones. So uh, specifically the soleus muscle, basically it is fused in the proximal half and in the distal half it is separated by a midline intramuscular septum. I want to talk a little bit about the, about the blood vessels which are entering the soleus muscle. So uh, we always say that there is one dominant pedicle and one or two minor pedicle. This has been described in the older books. But when you are doing your, even when we are doing our free fibula, we're able to see that the uh, many more pedicles are entering the soleus and this is now described in books and the first pedicle that goes to the to the medial belly the superior pedicle comes in from the popliteal artery and then from the tibioperoneal trunk after the tibioperoneal trunk uh, is uh, divides this the medical the medical the middle pedicle from of the medial belly also comes from the peroneal artery and it is the lower half of the flap or I should say from the middle and lower down that it is supplied, the medial belly is supplied the, by the posterior tibial artery. When you look at the lateral belly, the superior pedicle comes from the pos from the popliteal artery, the upper pedicle comes from the tibioperoneal trunk and later all the lower pedicles come from the peroneal artery. So this is how it is. You can see multiple pedicles. This is the medial belly of the soleus muscle and you can see how many pedicles, multiple pedicles are 
going to the soleus muscle. That's the tibial nerve that you see. So now what are the advantages of the soleus? It has a very consistent anatomy. There are reliable neurovascular pedicles because it has this bipinnate morphology and it has an independent neurovascular supply. We, it allows us to transfer just half the soleus. That way we do leave half the soleus for the use of the patient in the leg. And then the functional deformity is lesser. Cosmetic deformity of the soleus is also very less. We can close the donor site directly. Muscle can reach the uh, a lower third of the leg also on distal blood supply. But as I said, I am shy of doing a reverse a soleus. And it is a conventional workhorse flap for middle third of the leg. Disadvantages, of course, it has a visible scar on the posterior leg. And we need to understand the blood supply well before we do this flap. So now I want to give a few guidelines for flap elevation because soleus flap is not as easy as a gastronomous flap. So your patient uh, would be supine. As you, as you see, I've drawn a defect and you can always take your incisions which go from the edge of the defect and then you keep them two centimeter behind the posterior border of the tibia. Here you see that you incise the fascia and you should be able to see the soleus. You have to then, superior to the soleus, you have to make a plane between the gastronomus and the soleus. And this dissection is very sharp because the soleus also inserts into the tendoaculus. So this is, there is no real plane here and you have to essentially do very sharp dissection between the soleus and the gastronomus. What is being, what is in the retractor is the gastronomus. And what is in my hand, yeah, is the soleus. So this is the soleus and what is in the forceps now is the tendo, tendo tendon. So when you disconnect all the perforators till the middle, uh, till the somewhere till the middle of the leg, then you can start checking how much of your flap comes. And once the flap reaches there, you can stop dissecting any more superior. You can keep checking the arc of rotation in all these flaps, not just the muscle flaps. Even when we do our fasciocutaneous flaps, we can keep checking the arc of rotation when we are nearing the base of the flap. You will be able to see the plantaris between the soleus and the gastronomus. So here is the soleus completely dissected off. And again, like I showed you in the gastronomus, here you can see the arc. And you can see how beautifully, it's a beautifully wide flap. And you can cover, there you see the whole of the middle third of the leg. You can also cover the, it is the lower third of the flap. A clinical example uh, of the soleus having been used for middle third of the leg. You see a leg as bad as this. It was very fibrotic. He had been suffering for a very long time. He had a lot of comorbidities. And despite uh, there being so much of fibrous fibrosis, you can see that finally I managed to extricate a good soleus from, from inside all these tissues, which look like there would be nothing inside. And a good cover has been given to the leg. Similarly, in this patient with a lot of injuries, but soleus has been extricated and it has managed to cover the bone. Patient like this, who is an old case of osteomyelitis, it feels like how are we going to cover, but a good debridement, the bone walks off. And after that, just the muscles being brought together and he has had very good resolution of his symptoms. Now, let's talk about fasciocutaneous flaps. So, uh, fasciocutaneous flaps, well, commonest that we would do are either the peron peroneal uh, artery based or perforators from the peroneal artery or from the posterior tibial artery. So basically a lateral fasciocutaneous flap or a medial fasciocutaneous flap. Ratio in both of them is up to, is, is 1 is to 3. You can make it up to 1 is to 5 by doing a delay. Uh, the, the maximum perforators in the lateral are seen in the middle third of the leg and the uh, and of the medial flap are seen in the upper third of the leg. The lower limit of the lateral flap is about 12 cm from the lateral malleolus and the medial flap can be taken a little more distally. It's about 8 cm from the medial malleolus. Upper limit for the lateral uh, peroneal artery one is you can go up to the popliteal fossa. 
and whereas the medial flap is you need to be short by 10 cm from the popliteal fossa. Um, right, so now let's go to planning. What is important in planning? Always get a color Doppler done because you get a lot of information from color Doppler. Do your handheld Doppler because you want to understand the perforators, where they are there and mark them preoperatively. Mark the line of the perforator and when you are doing your Doppler, uh, we know what is going to be the vascular axis where you have to. The Dopplers will probably be heard not exactly on the vascular axis, but it will be about one centimeter on either side of the main trunk. It really depends on how the how that uh, perforator is running. Whenever you have any doubts, if they like the zone of trauma, if there are comorbid condition, or if you are going beyond the uh, usual limits of the flap, go ahead and do a delay. Always do a planning in reverse for all your flaps. You have to account for the extra length in your pattern. Always account for the extra length because your pattern is very thin. It will turn. But when we are uh, doing, when you are actually turning your flap, especially when it is a skin flap, then it takes up almost 3 to 5 centimeters more length. So often I tell my residents that to plan with a foam, you know, you use a half inch foam or something like that and that can mimic your skin flap and then you will understand even for your own understanding, it will be good if you use something like foam for your planning pre-operatively when you are practicing in the ward so that you understand how much extra a flap uses when it does the turn. Also remember that your inferiorly based flaps are basically balloon shaped. They are wider at the business end because a calf is wider. And also we can narrow the pedicle a bit. So automatically it becomes uh, a balloon shaped one. Now, uh, let's talk about the, uh, about the surface marking where you are going to do your perforator. Now, all of us, I think all of you know, I'll just repeat it very quickly. For the posterior tibial artery, you, you mark the tibial tuberosity, you mark the mid malleolar point and in between is the reference line and your vascular axis is 4.5 cm medial and parallel to it. For the peroneal artery, you mark the head of the fibula and you mark the tip of the lateral malleolus, that is your reference, reference line, and your vascular axis is 2.5 cm posterior and parallel to it. For the anterior tibial artery, again the reference line is the same, but now the vascular axis is 2.5 cm medial to this reference line. So the um, peroneal artery and the anterior tibial artery are on 2.5 cm each on both sides of the same reference line. For some reason, whenever uh, we ask residents and even in exams, often uh, students are very confused about the anterior tibial artery and I have seen this universally. So I would suggest that please practice to understand where the anterior tibial artery, what is the surface anatomy of the uh, anterior tibial artery. Now during surgery, your incision can start from the distal margin of the defect. When you are raising the flap, the first perforator which you sacrifice will help you locate the vascular axis. All these points that I am talking about have been uh, described by uh, Bhattacharya sir in his um, paper. It's a 2003 uh, paper on fasciocutaneous flap which was published in the IJPS. And uh, he says that it is essential to incorporate two to three sizable perforators in the pedicle. And usually the perforators are seen at about four to five centimeter intervals from the tip of the mandula. Now, I also say that when you are turning your flaps and you're doing an inset, please try and keep your raw area down to a minimum. Sometimes when you turn, you can actually get the base of the flap sitting on top of the some part of the uh, some part of the carrying segment and you can reduce the raw area anyway or you can graft a raw area but don't leave raw area behind in the carrying segment that just increases the chances of infection and it also increases your dressing needs. Now what are your limits of dissection? I have already showed you that or told you that but the lower limit is 8 cm from the malleoli for the medial side and for the medial flap and it is 10 cm from the popliteal fossa. What about the medial and the lateral borders? So when you are doing a flap which is based on the posterior tibial artery, you go only up to the mid-cuff. You don't cross the mid-cuff. 
But when you are doing a flap which is based on the peroneal artery, it is quite okay to go beyond and you can go beyond the mid calf for 2 to 3 centimeters. Now, why is it that failures happen? One is that if you have not optimized your patient well. So, you have to look at the general condition of the patient also. You have to make sure that there are no deficiencies, there are no mineral deficiencies, there are no protein deficiencies. All of these will go a long way towards a well-optimized patient will always give you a good result. If you have not done good flap planning, if you have not assessed the zone of trauma well and you pick a flap and then you say that, you know, there were scars or maybe you say, no, nothing will happen, but you land up with a problem. There is always a basis uh, to a problem when we have a problem. So we can't just say that my luck is bad and therefore I'm having a problem. It is, it is a good idea to keep on, when we do flap planning, when I plan a flap, I try my... Uh, I, I I try planning in reverse maybe two, three times before I'm finally satisfied and say it's fine. I keep looking at the local tissue because we are taking local or regional flaps. It is very important to look for the zone of trauma. At times, uh, I've seen the younger uh, people not include the deep fascia, not realize and that is what can cause a problem. The tissue handling has to be very gentle. The deep fascia should not shear from the skin. So the stitches that we take between the fascia and the skin are very important. Those from the fascia to the dermis. We should not suture under tension. After everything is done well, if the dress, dressing is with too much of pressure, we may land up with a problem. Hematomas are also a problem and a hematoma collecting beneath the flap can be a problem. So it is essential to always put drains under the flap. I think that uh, we had a lot of discussion during the case about arterial or venous issues. To my mind, keeping a wider base and I tend to keep, even if I'm doing adipofacial flaps, so the skin is just one single incision, but my adip adipofacial uh, pedicle is very wide. And also, if you're going to tunnel a flap, make sure that the tunnel is not tight and that there is no kinking of the pedicle. Just a few examples. Here you see a late case presenting to us, lower third. And you see that there is, there is a cut which is going into the calf. Here you can see, despite that, I've done a regional flap. And I have used this like a delay. And I have taken this huge inferiorly based facial cutaneous flap, which I have delayed. And you see how well the flap has finally done. It has settled well. And this is when I was dividing it. Similarly, a case of almost two-thirds the um, ankle area is got raw area. Again, a large facial cutaneous flap has been done from the leg. And you can see how well settled it is. You can see that there is no real raw area. I have not left any raw area behind. Graft is well settled. Similarly, a similar case. This is a heel ulcer in a case of PVD. Again, a delay has been done. Your large flap has been turned around. And finally, the final defect is just this much and the flap is reinsert back on the leg. Here, uh, just a, it's been done like a transposition flap, but it is a facial cutaneous flap which has been done for covering an internal fixation. Talking about a sural artery flap, Surulatri flap was first described as anti-grade in 1981 and 1992 uh, or in 1983 it was described as retrograde and later, 10 years later, 10 flaps were described by masculine. It is now the mainstay of reconstruction of the distal leg, foot and heel defects. What about its blood supply? Well, it has four sources of blood supply for this retrograde flap. It has perforators from the peroneal artery. It has perforators from the posterior tibial artery. It also has venocutaneous perforators from the small saphenous vein and neurocutaneous perforators from the sural nerve. So it has a, uh, it is getting its blood supply from many places. What about the venous drainage? Though the short saphenous vein is the main drainage, but it has valves. So since we are doing it as a reverse, uh, it will give us problems and therefore many people have do have venous problems with this flap. But small the parallel veins run along the length and these connect with the short saphenous. So the veins are bypassed. Also veins are there along with the perforators. These uh, vena comitants have no valves. So these also help in the venous drainage. 
So I think sorolateral flap is a good alternative to a free flap for lower limb reconstruction. Usually the pivot point is about 5 cm above the lateral malleolus. Always check that with the Doppler. Uh, I keep the pedicle as wide as possible. I know a lot of people thin the pedicle, but I keep the pedicle wide. Uh, especially if you are, it's a case of PVD or diabetes mellitus. Uh, I also like, occasionally like to keep the pivot point slightly higher so that two perforators can be included and one can always do a delay if you feel the extent is not reaching. I think if we judicially use this flap with delay and a wide base, the complication rate can be kept low. So a few examples of the sural artery flap. I'm going quickly now. These are just clinical examples to show that island flaps can do very well. They turn around well and you get a good aesthetic result in the end. Again, here you see these are all very, very small sural artery flaps done. And these are all done as fasciocutaneous base. Here you see a margolins ulcer which has been excised and that is the donor defect and that is the flap well settled. Here it was done for a TA defect and I had done an immediate reconstruction of the TA also. You can see here the fascia which has been used to reconstruct. And this was the, this is a very old case, almost 25 years old when we didn't use videos and we took photographs in this manner to show, uh, to show the function. Another uh, simple pseudolatry flap done with a facio, uh, fa adipofacial paddle. Here in this case of trauma, since I wasn't sure about the zone of injury, done this along with a skin pedicle. A child again done in an acute setting where part of it has been grafted and part flapped. Another in acute setting. And this was for a margolins. This was again for a PVD since whenever it's a Whenever there is a comorbid condition, I don't uh, use it as an adipofacial, but then I give a skin uh, paddle to it. Here, this uh, again for an internal fixation, a superiorly based sural artery flap has been done. And for the sarcoma, again, a superiorly based flap has been done. Going on to perforator flaps, I think we have already spoken a lot about perforator flaps. So I'll go ahead, just show you a clinical example, very similar to the case which was uh, shown today. That's a nice, well-settled flap. And you can see the perforator here. Again, similarly, you can see that there are two perforators. So one has been, one has been given up, cut, and you can see a well-settled flap. I don't want to forget cross-leg flaps. So cross-leg flaps, what kind of flaps can we do? Well, we can do standard, medially-based cross-leg flaps. How far can you go? The lateral margin, you can reach on the lateral side, go all the way back and be 2 to 3 centimeters from the lateral border of the tibia. Uh, my choice is usually either a superiorly or an inferiorly based fasciocutaneous flap or a pseudolateral flap. Uh, depending on where the defect is in the other leg, I, I think when we do these kind of flaps, it's easier. You see that if you have a flap like this, inferiorly based, and if you want to use it on the leg, then you get a much, much more carrying segment. And so you get more laxity and the patient is more comfortable in the cross leg. These are a few examples, old examples of cross leg. This is a standard cross leg flap, another standard cross leg flap. Even these cases were done with cross leg flap. So I cannot not talk about free flap. There's not much to tell in a free flap. Well, we'll take either an ALT or a a latissimus dorsi or a gracilis, whatever flap is there. Just remember that especially in the leg, uh, in especially in cases like these, the anterior tibial, I feel, always poses a problem. So I am much happier using the posterior tibial as the, um, as the vessel in which I anastomose the uh, free flap. Even if the defect is higher, if the posterior tibial is, is fine, then I can do an anastomosis lower down. It is not necessary that you always do it at the upper part. This was a fungating soft tissue sarcoma. I received this photograph from the orthopedic surgeon at Tata. And here you can see they've put a bone cement, put in a plate. And later, they have moved the fibula itself and into the gap of the tibia. And the plastic surgeons have done a flap. So at times, uh, none of these things work and even a free flap is a problem. So what unconventional can we do? For example, you see a patient like this. He's got a very large defect. You can see there's a lot of hardware above as well as below. You've got it at the upper part of the tibia as well as lower down. 
uh, the other, both the legs were injured, one a little less than the other. On an angiogram, this patient had a popliteal artery in, uh, occlusion. There was thrombus in the ETA and there was only a reduced runoff in the PTA and peroneal. There were no distal pulsations, but the limb was warm. So what could I do for a patient like this? I was not very eager to have the usual cross leg flap because that was the only leg which was available. So went ahead and did a cross leg free flap in this patient and you see a nice well settled flap later and the patient finally went back uh, could go back into society. A similar difficult case with respect to vascularity where uh, in this patient there was uh, occlusion of the anterior tibial and the common peroneal vessels. Again, uh, though you can see a posterior tibial artery in this, the uh, distal pulses were not palpable. So the pressure in the, in the vessel was not adequate. Here again, a cross leg free flap was done and these are the results. I cannot not talk about VAC and dermal substitutes. So I think VAC is a very good negative pressure wound therapy is very good. It is a good stopgap measure and often very small defects sometimes get covered and you may just get away with a skin graft. Uh, and with the with now with dermal substitutes being available in our country, small vital structures get covered and then you can put dermal substitutes and put a graft. We can do all this when vascularity is adequate and there is no infection or slough and no further surgery is contemplated at that site. So I'd like to conclude by saying that there are no simple answers to coverage of defect. Each defect is unique in terms of requirement and available tissue. And though we do have a best flap for a certain area, occasionally it may not work because of either a local uh, region local condition or some gen or general condition of the patient. I think one of the most important things is to understand what works best in your own hands. And we should work towards making at least one flap in each zone, our workhorse, be very comfortable with it so that you can always flog it and always plan it for a lifeboat. Also, when you're doing any surgery, make sure that your lifeboat is not transgressed during the first surgery. Also, while planning, always take your patient's views into consideration for the donor defect, whether it is aesthetic reasons or functional reason. For example, you can't just say that you will take an LD for a patient who already has, let us say, an amputation on one leg and he needs to use, uh, maybe he needs to use crutches or he has a heavy work that he needs to do with the upper limb. In an emergency where there is a severe trauma, use the Ganga scale and it will help to guide you towards salvage or an amputation. And whenever there is an amputation, see if you can do any spire, spare part flaps from it, from that this discarded amputated limb. Finally, I think you need to use your imagination and all your knowledge and experience to come to the right choice of coverage for each defect and whatever functional reconstruction you do, because our aim finally is to get this patient back into society. So this is a photograph from high up in the Himalayas and uh, just like you see this and you the real and the reflection is blending. I wish our flaps would blend like that. Doesn't really happen. But uh, that finally will be our aim to have as aesthetic reconstructions as possible. Thank you. Thanks a lot, ma'am. It was a very you know, rich, elaborate, elaborate and the exhaustive Thank presentation. Thanks a lot. Thank you. We are very really enriched and our knowledge got enriched. Sir, now we'll be taking the questions, Dr. Rohit. Uh, first question is, what is the weight bearing advice after the reconstruction by free or local regional flaps by Dr. One, yeah, one should, up to my mind, one should wait at least three months. <laughs> a, minimum of, a minimum of three months. You want to give full, you can give full weight bearing, but the patient is to be essentially told about uh, uh, about foot care and examining. <laughs> if we start giving that weight bearing on the flap, uh, we have to keep seeing how it is behaving. And the minute there is a problem, uh, we have to ask him to avoid it for some more time. I also like to give <laughs> silicone, uh, silicone pad, or you know, you can give something which will uh, which will reduce the load on that for some time. I've done a few ALT flaps in the heel also where uh, you know nerve has been joined together 
they do get some protective sensation. But my thought is that even if we do whatever we do on the heel, whether it is a muscle flap or any flap, if mm -hmm. it's not, they land up with ulcers. Dr. Rohit, unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay. Ma'am, there is another question from Dr. K. Like, ma'am, what? I thought before, before we go to the next one, I would like to know uh, sir's view on this, Dr. Bhattacharya, regarding how long to wait. Because uh, I think all of us have our own, you know, sort of what we are comfortable with. But I would just like your views because you have specifically done, uh, you know. Yeah. Actually, actually uh, there is no definite answer. It depends upon how you assess the patient in your follow. Correct, correct. And you try to see the sensation, most important. Of course, the bulk reduces little with pressure and all that. But sensation comes from the periphery. Yeah. And therefore, you start checking the sensation from the periphery towards the center. And... Uh, but if the suppose the uh, some part of the flap is on the skin, some part part of the flap is on the sole sole skin. So the two types of skins are different. There the the development of sensation and the duration is also different. So minimum three months definitely. But uh, regular follow up, if you feel that you should wait further, then up to six months, even nine months, you have to convince the patient. Because otherwise they come with an ulceration or hypertrophic formation along the margin of the uh, junction of the flap and the sole. So there is no definite rule. Minimum may be three months. But uh, if the patient is younger and if the patient is older with comorbidity like diabetes, etc. or other systemic disease, again, you have to wait longer. Because we, we, we have to convince them that we are waiting longer for your benefit so that you don't develop ulceration or there's a cut or a burn uh, or a trauma and you don't you don't know suddenly you uh, recognize it so it, it it depends upon the comorbidity the age the atherosclerotic changes etc but 3 to 6 months definitely yes okay right question this is question from k when it's mentioned like that what would be what would be the vessel of choice for a free flap in a defect just distal to the knee joint or over the knee joint in yeah so actually you will have to finally go to the posterior tibial artery only no uh posterior tibial artery if you're taking from lower down otherwise the popliteal artery yeah i also have occasionally taken sural artery so everything depends on where you know I'm happy if you can take the pseudal artery, then I'm not touching the popliteal artery. But many are using the popliteal artery. I'm not that comfortable. I would prefer to use a branch. Or genicular branch from that can be used also. That's I'm very uncomfortable going there. And pseudal arteries are also very good donors, actually. It varies case to case, madam. That's what, even I yeah. think it varies case. We cannot have anything fixed. Finally, I think that's how microvascular has changed so much over the last 25 years. You know, there's so much more. Uh, I mean, people are just doing perforator flaps. They're even suturing to perforator. So everything depends on what kind of flap you're doing and what is your comfort level. What is the kind of microscope you have? What is the sort of suture material you have? Actually, here goes what you said that what is your comfort level? How comfortable the surgeon is with what he's, what he's doing? That is the important thing. So I think the young ones also need to realize that they cannot immediately start aping someone who is, you know, able to use a 10-0 or a 11-0 comfortably. So you will grow in your, uh, you will grow in your practice as a microsurgeon since microsurgeon has a, uh, is, uh, is very charming to a lot of people. But I love regional flaps. So I think that if I can extend my brain, plan a regional flap and even if finally now in today's day and age we do a free flap but I want that planning because it's always yes, no. that is a problem you you we cannot give up our, our skills of planning regional flaps and understanding the local regional tissues it is very important uh, moving to next question ma'am. how to prevent pinch cushion effect to the flap during surgery or how to correct pinch cushion effect after once the flap settled completely. So does anybody want else want to take it or should I only answer? Means there are other panelists that's why I'm asking. 
put a mute in. I'll only tell. Okay. So I would want to do half mm -hmm. tap at a time. Mm -hmm. That means I will incise it, uh, half of it. And when you do, you thin the flap also at the same time. So what happens, especially after a year, there's always a lot of excess flap that you have. Essentially, the flap softens, uh, the tissue softens, so there'll be a fold. So you can uh, do a flap thinning. And when you are reinserting again, then you can uh, make like, you can either do something, I'm just saying something like a Z plus. You basically, you insert tissue in between. Don't let it uh, be circular. <laughs> And then after uh, three and a half, four months, whenever you feel that tissue equilibrium is reached, we cannot we cannot give a cutoff of three months. You may even have to wait six months before you do the other side. Everything I think three months is also very borderline. I am a bit more conservative. I would prefer uh, six months to wait before I do the other side. Mm -hmm. There is another question from Subhashri for heel reconstruction. What should be flap of choice? Is it a muzzle flap or fascia cutaneous flap? Because fascia cutaneous flap may cause wobbling effect. Muzzle flaps can be prone to ulceration. So ma'am, what should be our flap of choice? The first choice, if it fits and it's, you know, would be the medial plantar artery flap for a heel. Because you are giving plantar skin to plantar skin. Let us say, let us say that that is not there, not available for what? <laughs> okay, in that case, uh, uh, you can also do a thinned, uh, you know, an ALT or if you are doing an ALT, if you are doing a facial cutaneous flap, though it is described that it is wobbly, uh, none of my patients have specifically said that that is a problem. So I have done a good number of facial cutaneous flaps also. Though described, I have not faced that. Maybe some amount of fibrosis probably happens with all the walking that they do. So I think in the beginning, it may feel that it is wobbly, but then finally all that settles. Muscle flaps, yes, can be done, but I think that muscle flaps are facing more ulcerations than the uh, patient. That is my, my personal um, thought on this matter. So again, uh, uh, depends on availability. We're doing muscle flap when we are doing free flap. If I am taking the uh, a regional facial cutaneous flap to the heel, then it is obviously a facial cutaneous flap. I am not taking a, a muscle when I am taking regional. This choice happens when you are talking about a free flap. Despite that, I have often done uh, ALTs also for just the heel. Good protective sensation also develops. So if anybody else wants to give their opinion, this is mine. Because again, this is very controversial. So I feel that the students should hear two or three other views also. I think in my view, facial cutaneous flap is much better than muscle flap. Because there will be graft. And that will be much more prone to <clears throat> that ulceration and uh, <laughs> disruption. And that Dr. Bhattacharya said that uh, we have to wait for sensation to develop from sites. If we are not using neurosensate flap as medial plantar, then uh, we can wait and uh, tell the patient to take precautions, and uh, after that, some sensation develops and patient is all right. And there will be, as a, of course, you have said that there will be fibrosis later on. Yes, there so is. So it is much better in patient cutaneous. Yes. See what I feel is. Can I speak? Yes, yes sir. <laughs> please, sir, please. What I feel is that whether it's a free flap, muscle flap, facial cutaneous flap, none of them are sensitive to start oh. with. Even if you sensitize the flap, even then it is not sensitive in the beginning. It takes time. So you, ha you have to insist on the patient that they have to wait for the development of sensation. As far as uh, muscle flap versus facial cutaneous, Certainly, facial cutaneous will be better because muscle flap is much more to ulceration because of the graft on the top of it. And it is weight bearing area, especially the heel and the sole. And facial cutaneous, as Professor Vinita said, as they walk, it gets compressed. So, seldom my patients have complained of walk. It is, I feel it is more theoretical yeah, uh, yeah. expression. Yes. Exactly. Now, there is another question from Madhu Bharadwaj, Dr. Madhu Bharadwaj. 
is it advisable to do plating of a bone in a neglected fracture <laughs> a chronic open wound along with flap for in same sitting or do it as a stage procedure actually in a open wound you don't want to do plating at all because you will yeah. just cause a problem so you would go ahead with an external fixator and if it is a chronic neglected thing then it would probably already have a fixator so you and if there is a plate sitting out there then it needs to come out uh, you do an external fixator whether you want to do a bone graft at that time because probably it would have gone into non union also it would have not been uh, you know uh, it would not be like it's not like it's a united bone so you go ahead do a external fixator do the debridement that is needed it is possible that the debridement may lead to a gap then we have to decide whether we want to do anything for the gap at that time or do a flap and do i had mentioned that in my talk so everything depends on what is a what is a gap that is there if we have to put a bone graft my choice would be that i would put the bone graft as a second stage give a flap because it is a chronic neglected wound already the patient has suffered a lot so let's go ahead in stages yes it is better to do bone work in stages first you cover with the flap and then later on you go the but the bone absolutely work. no question of plating 100 that is no, no. Option of that and don't even put an intramedullary nail or anything like that that will also cause a problem external fixator yes. should be your uh, method of choice in a case which is open and neglected Uh, we have a question during presentation. What do we use for chemical delay regarding delay? Yes. I also don't know the answer. I don't know the answer as I have never seen this or read. Actually, books or books describe that describe some adrenergic alpha blockers. They have used, <laughs> and we are not used. We have not used clinically them. Since we are but they are described in books. Yeah. Correct. I remember when we were students also, it was given a man in McCarthy. Yeah, ma'am. Uh -huh. Probably the questioner knows the answer. Let let he or she answer. No, it must be there. It is there in the books, but sir. it is in the books. It is in the books. <laughs> are there any more questions? Just for uh, academic purposes. I just want to repeat a question which you have already answered now. Like, is the Allen's test applicable to the lower limb as well? Can so we do that? So call it the Allen's test, but the principle is the same, and I think we should always evaluate our patient fully clinically before we go into the uh, uh, investigations, and it just it helps to match the. See, whenever we do Doppler ultrasound, all of these are also person dependent, right? So it is good for us to have a clinical idea first and then go in for a Doppler because we always get a color Doppler done. It's not that we don't get it done. But at this rate, we will lose our clinical skills if we don't do mm -hmm. clinical examination. Uh, as well. There is one question I didn't get the question. So like, what is cross leg pre flap? Any of the panelists? Yes, exactly that. You, uh, you take a you pick your free flap, you pick your flap and you attach your flap to the other leg, not to the recipient leg, right? So now you have a flap which is gaining its blood supply from the opposite leg. Then just like you would insert a cross leg flap, you insert the flap. We just have to be a little way more careful when we are doing a cross leg free flap because we have to make sure that the there is no, uh, there is absolutely no movement between the legs. So always... I do an external fixator in these cases and we fix the legs well. Other thing is that the training period is much longer and we can't really risk separating early. Other thing with my experience, I've done almost six or seven of these. These are not very commonly done. And I have realized that it is easier to train the flap if it is a skin flap. So my earlier uh, cross leg free flaps were all LDs. And when I tried training, I realized that when during the training, they would go blue because the venous drainage was not really developing that easily. I moved on to doing cross leg ALT flaps and I realized that they trained much faster and they gained their blood supply because they had 100% inset of skin to skin and they did much better. So basically, it's a, it's a, it's a mm -hmm. flap with blood supply being taken from the other leg. Normal leg. From the yeah normal leg. Thank you, ma'am. 
what if this but is done. my patients yeah uh-huh. my patients are requesting that don't uh, don't give me a skin graft there don't take a lot of skin already this leg is gone so in those situations i've done this and i think all the cases have done well dr ratnam has yes sir yeah uh, just uh, purely theoretical purely academic but uh, uh, if there is, is anybody who has experience with that please come out otherwise let us try to uh, remember that option that is dr govila's flap dr ashok govila of pj uh, um, chandigarh uh, professor bro govila he did a flap uh, just short of uh, cutting the vascular pedicle neurovascular pedicle and extra corporeal extra corporeal extra corporeal yes. <laughs> extra corporeal flap without mm-hmm. detaching mm-hmm. immediately and the pedicle he uh, circles with his uh, skin graft as required as length as required uh, so uh, the expertise of uh, uh, immediate requirement for uh, uh, micro surgery is not required you can keep it a cross leg like class leg flap mm-hmm. but patient is more comfortable more convenient and then uh, uh, blood supply simultaneously it takes from the donor site uh, recipient site also so uh, anybody has got what uh, so uh, is sir i have done quite a few extra corporeals also yeah yeah uh-huh. we have done sural flaps for the so radial uh, artery but not in the leg i have not done extra we have done for uh, radial artery forearm i have done radial yeah, yeah. radial artery yeah. forearm we do yes for the yeah. uh, for the forehead i have done i have once done a radial artery for an abdominal defect it was almost the whole abdomen was involved in a, a tumor after that was excised i put a mesh and i had done a uh, omental flap it was the only choice there was nothing else could be done but part little part of the omentum had was lost and then i did an extra corporeal radial artery in that but i also do a lot of extra corporeal posterior intraosseous artery flaps because i bring the pedicle from outside i just put a graft on it when i want to take the posterior intraosseous artery let us say i want to take it all the way till you know so distal if i want to take it so distally it jumps from above and the pedicle is outside so it's extra corporeal put a graft and after 3 weeks or so i just have to cut it mm-hmm. under local anesthesia you can cut it and it does well also what i realize in extra corporeal because we are putting a graft it is my theory i have not proved that because your graft also contracts it very gradually also trains the flap to gain better supply from the bed and i have not really ever trained these extra corporeal flaps and i have just directly managed to cut it at 3 3 and a half weeks without a problem because the inset is also almost 100% it's like 99% inset that is exactly the benefit of it yeah okay. yeah we have done extra corporeal for the leg also reverse sural we have done two reverse sural we have done sural flaps yes, for the opposite leg we mm-hmm. have done sir so, and the radial forearm we have done for the neck we have done for the forehead we have done for nose we have done really delighted that you emphasize the importance of the local regional flaps with very practical tips third thing is uh, you mentioned about iatrogenic here i would like to mention that iatrogenic i have seen several but most commonly is in the over the tendo achilles causing exposure yes, because sir. they don't know how to make the incision yes sir if you make a laziest incision raising two flaps on either side then your flap covers the tendoachylis area whether you do a tendoachylis reconstruction or revivoplasty or lengthening or whatever so that avoids that incision simply avoids yes sir uh, <clears throat> then uh, i'd like to mention that many a times if a single flap is not adequate enough then you can have double flaps right. either from medial side or lateral side or even muscle flap with facio cutaneous adu facial flap with muscle and so many so that is the combination of flap so double flap has utility uh for the sheen defect whatever flap we give it looks like little bulky and then if you have if you can use a facial turnover flap from the gastrocnemius and put a skin graft it will never be bulky and the sheen defect will be covered very nicely aesthetically it will be very good and uh, then whenever we come across any defect i feel that we should divide the defect into graftable and 
requiring flat. Not that even a granulating area, you have to design a flap. Okay. So, uh, so whatever area requires flap is flap, rest can be grafted. Anyway, you are grafting the donor site of the flap also. <clears throat> then as far as muscle flap is concerned, because we are sacrificing a functional unit in an already traumatized limb. So we are sometimes a little hesitant. So you can use a split muscle flap. The sagittal splitting, which is almost about 40 to 50% sagittally you can split. And we have done the cadaveric dissection with dye studies. And I have done clinically. So you can spare the muscle functional unit as well as you can use the muscle flap for cover. Uh, so split muscle flap. Uh, then the uh, intraoperative assessment uh, research-wise or even clinical-wise. Uh, can be best uh, done by the fluorescent study. So fluorescent is a very useful and simple and cheap technique. And uh, then the other flaps, for example, the tendoachylis area. The, if, see, we, have, we don't have to forget that any tendon requires an ideal cover. An ideal cover is a tenosynovial membrane because that allows the uh, tendon to glide. That's the natural gliding surface. And here uh, we have the uh, tenosynovial flap from the peroneus longus and brevis, uh, covering the peroneus longus and brevis. Very thin, nicely, it can be tunneled to the any area you want, especially uh, tendoachylis area. And donor side is closed primarily. It is based on the perforator from the peroneal artery at around 5 centimeter from the tip of malleus, lateral malleus. And uh, as you have correctly mentioned, when you do a cross leg flap, then instead of a horizontal cross leg flap, which is more frequently used and better understood, an inferiorly based cross leg flap have two advantages. One is that the calf area is very wide. As you have correctly said, it's a balloon shaped flap. You can narrow down the pedicle to almost three to four centimeter to have more mobility to cross to the other side. So it gives more mobility and more tissue. And the patient is also more comfortable. You don't have to fix it like in uh, you know, horizontal flap, which sometimes some people say fix with pins and so on. Because of the narrow pedicle and the bridge segment, the patient is very comfortable. So I, I always preferred, I used to do earlier uh, cross leg, long back, horizontal, but later on, again, long back. <laughs> uh, I use the uh, infrared based cross leg flap because I could move more tissue with more flexibility. So these are the points which I thought I should uh, add. Thank you.